just get settled. We're just gonna have some time as we wait for everyone to come join us. Oh, wow, you guys are flying in. I love it. If you've been with us in the past, you might notice a little change on your screen. We decided to change it up a bit. And uh, wow. All right, my friends, we're going to give it another, you know, another minute or two, let people kind of find ourselves and Wow, really channeling the yoga class I was taking before, really finding ourselves, finding our center, coming into our wonderful historical headspace. A little more time. Wow, you guys, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. If I was in a physical program, I'd be worried about the cold and rain, but you guys are doing wonderful. I'm so excited. <laughs> All righty. So as everyone kind of kind of come rolling in, um, please get yourself situated, get everyone nice and comfy at home. I'm going to give my boring spiel as people kind of roll in. Um, and then we will get started. All right. Well, welcome everyone to National Park Service Presents. Um, this is a program that usually tends to take place in the branches. It has more of an intimate physical setting, but um, this is the year everything changed and we decided to do something different. Um, if you've been with us in the past, you will notice that your screen does look a little different because so many people have decided to join us and it was so wonderful and exciting. We decided to change it over into more of a cleaner visual setting. So instead of having everyone's cameras and microphones, we switched it over to more of a webinar format. So no one's camera will be turning on, no one has the mic on. Um, it has just our amazing panelists and the presentation. Um, and hopefully it will just be look a little cleaner on your screens as you're watching. Um, okay, anyway, this is a series that has, we started this the 5th of January and it's been taking place every other Tuesday evening starting at 6 p.m. Um, we're about halfway through and the last one will end on the 27th of April. Now, even though there's been a whole multitude of topics that this series will go over, um, you will notice uh, the BPL's overall programming theme of Repairing America really weaving itself throughout the entire series. Um, but before we even begin into the actual real history part, I'm going to do a few more boring Zoom features. One, we are recording this. So this is very exciting. It's our first one in the series that we're actually recording. Um, so in the future, you might be able to watch it later, um, which is, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, there is still the ability to ask questions. So down in the chat, so in like your box down below, it's a little bubble that says chat. Um, you're able to click on it and you can type in your questions. Uh, Sean, the wonderful presenter from last time, uh, is moderating uh, the, the questions and comments as it goes through. Um, they will not be answered immediately. We would love Jocelyn to kind of get in her groove. We don't want to interrupt her all the way through. So most of the questions will be answered at the end. Um, but please feel free to type your questions or even comments. If you do do that, be aware of the to button. You want to make sure you're sending it, if you're sending it to everyone or to a panelist or something. Uh, just be aware of who you're sending it to. Um, checking my notes real quick. Oh, and at the very end of the presentation, there will be a survey that pops up. If you're feeling like it and feeling comfy and open to it, please fill it out. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, 
And now, before you hear me say um one more time, I'm going to hand it over to Jocelyn, the amazing ranger who's going to be presenting beyond the 54th. Take it away, Jocelyn. Thank you, Karen. Um, if you could give me permission to share my screen, that would be very helpful. We'll just wait a moment. There we go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so as Karen introduced me, I am Jocelyn Gould. Uh, I am a park ranger with the National Parks of Boston. And tonight we're going to be talking a bit about the 54th Massachusetts. Uh, the uh, National Parks of Boston is comprised of three units of the National Park Service and they are located right in downtown Boston. I know a lot of you have probably been to them, but if you haven't, um, just a quick overview. Uh, these three parks include Boston National Historical Park, which is my home park, and that talks about the American Revolution, World War II, and innovation in technology. We also have Boston African American National Historic Site, which focuses on the North Slope of Beacon Hill, where a free Black community resided and fought for equal rights and freedoms in the 19th century. And we also have the uh, Boston National, excuse me, Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, uh, which focuses not only on the amazing history of the city of Boston and its coast, but also the unique natural features as well. Now, all of these sites reside upon the land traditionally associated with the Massachusetts tribe. And I would like to begin by acknowledging them. Uh, not only are they the tribe of indigenous people for whom the colony, province, and commonwealth of Massachusetts have taken their name, many of their ancestors also fought alongside men like the 54th. I'd like to pay my respect to their ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historical Massachusetts tribal territories to this day. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the men who served in the United States colored troops during the Civil War, especially those who served in the 54th, 55th, and 5th Massachusetts regiments. And that includes not only the men who fought, but the people who supported them uh, back home. Being some of the first uh, people to attempt something is never an easy thing. And the toll that this took on them and their families was immense. Um, if there are any people uh, who are descended from these men and women in the audience tonight, I thank you for your family's service and sacrifice. So while a lot of uh, the people listening tonight are from the Boston area, and some of you are very well acquainted with the story of the 54th, um, there are a lot of people who might not be as familiar with them or might be from another area. And I would just like to try a little experiment. Um, so when I say the words 54th Massachusetts, what immediately comes to your mind? And I, I'd like you to drop that into the chat if you can. I'll give you a few minutes to add your thoughts. Excellent. Okay, a lot of nice comments here. All right. So as I suspected, um, a lot of people came up with two different things um, that they associate with the 54th. And they are the 54th Memorial, which is located at the Boston Common, um, which is on the upper left corner of the slide and the movie Glory, of which a um, movie still is on the lower right. Now these two items are both very unique artistic icons, um, but they do not and cannot tell the whole story of this regiment. So the memorial uh, shows the regiment in a single solitary moment. And um, that moment was when they were leaving the Boston Common in 1863. And Glory is a, uh, attempts to tell a complicated and very messy story in just two hours and two minutes of runtime, uh, only featuring a few actual historic figures. I saw somebody mention Matthew Broderick um, and Robert Gouldshaw, 
the rest of the characters included in the movie are compilations or glosses of various people. So neither of these can or do tell the full story, uh, but they do provide a opportunity for individuals like us to dip into that history and start to learn about what was going on in the 1860s. And that begs the question, what was happening in the 1860s that brought about units like the 54th? Well, on July, uh, January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Now this uh, had a provision within the text of the document that stated that African-American men could finally serve in the United States Army as soldiers. Um, this was a incredible moment for many people including members of the political scene and abolitionist community here in Boston. And they began to work immediately on what would be called the 54th. Uh, because this would be the first all black regiment raised in the North, there was a lot of pressure to make sure that this unit was filled out fully. Um, and so many of the prominent abolitionists throughout the United States encouraged their, their male relatives, their sons, grandsons, nephews, brothers to enlist. And it kind of made the 54th Regiment one infused with 19th century celebrity. Now on the left, you see an image of Sojourner Truth um, and she did not join the 54th, um, but you can see right here in her lap is a very small photograph. And that photograph is a image of her grandson, James Caldwell. Caldwell enlisted in Company H of the 54th on April 17th, 1863. But unfortunately, just about two months later, he was taken as a prisoner of war on July 16th, and that was at James Island. James would be held as a prisoner of war until March 4th, 1865. So while he joined the 54th with intention to serve throughout the war, he unfortunately uh, spent the majority of his time in various prisons throughout South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Two other recognizable individuals who uh, joined the 54th were Charles and Lewis Douglas, sons of Frederick Douglas, one of the most photographed men of the 19th century. Um, they are shown here in this image on the right with uh, Joseph, Joseph Douglas standing behind them. He is the grandson of Frederick, and the son of Frederick. Uh, Charles Douglas would be transferred um, to the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry and promoted to first sergeant. Unfortunately, Lewis Douglas had a very different story. He stayed with the 54th, was appointed as a sergeant major, which was the highest rank a black soldier could hold at the time. Um, but he was wounded in the leg during the assault on Fort Wagner. And those wounds were severe enough that he had to receive a honorable discharge due to physical disability. But you cannot go to war with just three individuals. Um, so what about the rest of the regiment? Well, there would be approximately 1500 men who would try to enlist in the 54. They did not all make it through the process or um, once they made it through the process, stay with the 54. The final number of men in the regiment would hover around 1,100 um, because some of the men who joined up were transferred like Charles Douglas was to the 55th and the 5th to help fill out their ranks once they were established. Others um, were deemed ineligible because of various health issues or language barriers. Um, there are a few different reasons why people were not fully boarded. These enlistments began on February 10th of 1863 and went all the way to March of 1865. And those who would make it in generally signed up for a three-year enlistment. The uh, age range of these men would go from 16 uh, for the youngest, although some of them later claim that they signed up when they were 15 or even 14 years old. Um, the eldest enlistee was 47 years old. And there were approximately um, 40 men, 40 or older, who joined up. But they, they were an anomaly. Um, the average age of these men who enlisted in the 54th was 24 years old. So they were a very young group of men um, who were working together for the first time. 
They also were coming from all over the United States. Plus, uh, there are a number of people from other countries. So there are about 26 men from Canada, uh, a handful from the Caribbean, and then um, one or two from Central and South America. And when you have, you know, 1,100 men, you might think that you have at least 1,100 different uh, ideas and inspirations for why they joined the 54th. But we can kind of look at um, this letter that I recently uh, found while doing research on the 55th uh, that was in the file of Samuel Cable. He was a member of the 55th Massachusetts and he made his intentions and motivations for joining very clear in a letter that he had written to his wife who remained enslaved in Missouri. Cable had escaped from slavery and joined up with the 55th in June of 1863. He did not know how to write, so he um, had somebody uh, write this letter down for him and mail it to his wife. And he says, quote, I have enlisted in the army. I am now in Massachusetts, but before this letter reaches you, I will be in North Carolina. And though great is the present national difficulties yet, I look forward to a brighter day when I shall have the opportunity of seeing you in the full enjoyment of freedom. Samuel Cable does not leave it to any question. His inspiration and motivation is to free his wife, his family, and all others who are enslaved. Now, luckily, um, I did find um, instances of Samuel surviving the war, um, but I have not figured out the name of his wife and whether or not they were able to re reunite together after 1865. So that's one of my next mysteries to try and solve. Now the men who enlisted um, with the 54th would fight at places like Fort Wagner, Alusty, and Honey Hill along with uh, many smaller skirmishes. They also guarded prisoners of war, helped recruit new men into the regiment, and acted as nurses at the uh, hospitals that sprung up after all those battles. On top of all of that, in addition to having to fight Confederates and take care of the regular duties of uh, being in camp life, these men were also fighting against another thing, institutional racism. And that is evident by uh, the 19 month uh, battle that they fought with the federal government. Now, as you can see on this uh, broadside here, uh, it says that they will be paid $13 a month. That was the pay of a, a private in the army at that time. Um, but unfortunately, that was a pay for white soldiers at the time. The black soldiers who joined up with the 54th were going to be paid $10 a month. And from that, $3 was going to be deducted for clothing, leaving them with just $7 a month. Because of this discrepancy, the men of the 54th went on a pay strike. And as I said, it would take 19 months for this to be settled. Those who died in the interim, uh, many of them have a notation in their files that says never paid. So these men were fighting on a number of different um, fronts. And in spite of all these fights and threats that they had to do and deal with, the men of the 54th continued to serve bravely and prove their naysayers wrong. In the end, the regiment was honorably discharged on August 29th of 1865 and welcomed home with a grand parade. While some of these men decided that they wanted to go back and have a nice quiet life, others were energized by the experiences that they had and wanted to continue, um, but they kind of needed to figure out a vehicle on how to do so. And that vehicle came in the form of um, the fraternal organizations that would pop up after the Civil War, most notably the Grand Army of the Republic or the GAR. Uh, the GAR was founded first in Springfield, Illinois in 1866. And that same year, the first post was established in Massachusetts in the city of New Bedford. Now the motto of the, of the GAR was fraternity, charity, and loyalty. And you wanna kind of think of them as a combination of a few different organizations that we have today, which serve our veteran populations. So 
It acted like today's Veterans Association in that it provided opportunities for education, um, both in uh, learning how to give public speeches, learning how to read and write, and also some job training or job opportunities. It also uh, helped men get medical attention when they needed it, often from the wounds that they received or injuries that they received during the Civil War. Uh, and they would help uh, provide food and um, help when those men needed it. It also acted as today's Veterans of Foreign Wars and helped to provide a safe space or kind of a clubhouse for these men to gather together, tell stories, connect with their old friends and make new ones among people that would understand their experiences from the war. And there would often be gatherings of music, lectures and meals that members would attend and share together with their families often. That provided a really good sense of camaraderie and friendship for these veterans. It also acted as a place uh, to become or continue being an activist and agitate on behalf of their fellow soldiers, families, or the poorer communities that surrounded the posts. Uh, many posts took this motto to heart and really tried to spread their good works throughout their communities. Uh, this is a great mural um, from New Bedford. And it might seem odd to a number of people that New Bedford was the site of the first GAR post and not Boston, but you don't have to look too deeply into New Bedford's history for it to make sense. Um, if you joined Sean's talk um, two weeks ago, you know that a lot of people uh, who were seeking freedom took to the water and uh, arrived in places like New Bedford. Because it was such a busy port, in what was considered a very safe state, uh, Mass New England, uh, excuse me, New Bedford became a prominent stop on the Underground Railroad. And by the end of 1853, the city had the highest percentage of African Americans of any city in the Northeast. And because of that, uh, it was a regular stop for abolitionists to visit, uh, to learn from the newly arrived freedom seekers, and to give lectures. And it's pretty uh, reasonable that this is also one of the um, reasons why New Bedford got a recruiting station. Uh, when that recruitment station opened up, the city responded very, very strongly. They had approximately 120 men make their way to sign up for the 54th. Um, about 25% of them were from the city of New Bedford. And they were mostly put into Company C. Uh, James Henry Gooding was one of those men who signed up. Uh, he was born in New York, but employed in New Bedford as a whaler. And during his time with the 54th, he wrote letters uh, which were published kind of like a, an embedded reporter today um, to uh, the New Bedford Mercury. And in one of them, he claimed, quote, among the men in this camp, the New Bedford men stand A, number one, in military bearing, cleanliness, and morality. Um, so they were obviously doing their city proud and took care to act at the highest level that they could. After the uh, war was over, many of these men returned to New Bedford and would join that GAR post. Now, one of the most famous members of the 54th, I saw his name pop up in the chat earlier, um, was William Carney. And he was a member of that uh, post of New Bedford. During the assault on Fort Wagner, Kearney received three serious wounds while saving the American flag from capture by stuffing it into his shirt and running back to the lines for safety. And once he got there, he stated, quote, boys, the old flag never touched the ground and promptly fainted due to blood loss, which is completely understandable. For these actions, Kearney was awarded the Medal of Honor um, and that occurred in May of 1900, making him retroactively the first black recipient of this award. Upon returning home to New Bedford, uh, Kearney and the other men um, from the 54th, many of them joined the post, which was the Lieutenant Colonel William Logan Rodman post. Um, and you can see here in this photograph, um, if you look three rows back and then three men in, you can see William Carney right there, peeking his head out. Now, William Carney was the most famous man 
of the 54th um, enlisted men. He had songs and poet and poems and all different kinds of uh, pieces of art written about him. His photograph was in newspapers. His name was known to most Americans. And he was able to use that power to provide that fraternity, charity, and loyalty to the people in the post who were a little less powerful than he was. One of those men was Cornelius Henson. And he enrolled in the 54th on February 28th, 1863. Unfortunately, also taken prisoner after the assault on Fort Wagner. Now he was sent directly to Andersonville prison in Georgia. And he was able to survive 19 months there before being exchanged on March 4th of 1865. Like a lot of prisoners of war, Henson suffered incredibly. He carried both physical and mental scars with him and uh, his injuries made it almost impossible for him to support his family. When he first applied for a pension, Henson received uh, $4 per month. That is approximately $70 today. It took his fellow soldiers like William Carney speaking up and providing testimony about his capture, imprisonment, and lasting injuries for his pension to be doubled uh, to $8 or about $140 today. Um, and after his death, they were able to su successfully transfer that pension to his widow, Mary. That is not the first time or last time that they would do that. Um, the men would gather uh, to help Amelia Campbell, who was the widow of Joseph Campbell. She applied for a widow's pension and the testimony of the, the men from Company C uh, really gave her application strength. They were able to recall when and how Joseph Campbell died. One man even remembered a quote that he uh, uttered before Joseph Campbell died. And this was enough information to satisfy that pension agent. Now, unfortunately, Amelia Campbell died before she was able to gain access to that pension, but the money again was transferred successfully to their infant son, who would have a pension of $8 a month until his 16th birthday waiting for him. Now, William Carney um, was a member of the Post in New Bedford, but he also traveled a lot. And uh, one place that he traveled to was Boston and would visit the post of the GAR that was located there. Um, it was called the Robert A. Bell Post, number 134. This was established in 1870. And not only was it the largest organization for Black veterans in Boston, it was the first uh, post of the GAR for Black veterans from the Civil War in the entire United States. Robert Bell was a black sailor from Boston who died at Fort Fisher in North Carolina. Um, I haven't been able to find uh, any records of his death or the reason why he was chosen as a namesake for this post. Um, so there are a lot of different mysteries that I need to tease out still. Most of the references to Bell are actually in regards to the post and not to the person. Um, but in my research, I did find a article solely about his mother, Annette, upon her death in 1907. This is fairly um, important because Black women generally did not get a call out in a newspaper upon their death. But the reason that happened is because she left her entire estate, which included a home in Arlington and $1,000 in cash to the Home for the Little Wanderers, which is still a uh, charity group here in Boston today. Now, the Bell Post met in a lot of different places. They were a post without a home at the beginning of their existence. Um, but in 1877, they were able to finally get a home. And that was at the Smith School. This building was uh, erected in 1835, and it was the first public school for Black children in the city of Boston. Uh, it was associated with a lot of school uh, segregation issues in the 1840s and 50s. But by 1855, Massachusetts had desegregated its school systems, and so the building was no longer in use. Um, so it became the headquarters for the Bell Post in 1877 for the nice low cost of a dollar a year, um, and was their headquarters until at least 1934. Today, 
Um, the Smith School is uh, part of the complex that is administered by the Museum of African American History in Beacon Hill, one of our really amazing partners here in the city of Boston. Now, once they got that home base, Post 134 took their motto to heart. Not only did they provide fraternity by hosting what they call campfires at the time, um, those were evening programs with music, lectures, and an opportunity to smoke pipes with old friends. Um, they also provided friendship during people's worst moments by acting as pallbearers during funerals for members. They also would provide charity. They hosted a lot of fundraisers um, that needed for people that needed food or medical assistance. But they did not limit their good works only to their members or only to Black Bostonians. Um, the Boston Globe reported on December 29th of 1873 that the Post put up um, two Christmas trees in the building that they were in at that time. And those trees were, quote, placed in the hall and loaded with useful articles of all descriptions as far as the branches would bear, which were distributed to the poor of the West End. A noticeable feature of the occasion was the presence of many white persons, poor widows and orphans, who came in response to a cordial invitation of the post and received many presents that made their hearts glad. Now loyalty to the country had been shown and earned on the battlefield by these men during the war, but continued to be shown in the yearly patriotic exercises that they, uh, they conducted. Not only were they proud of their service as Americans, they were proud of their service as Black Americans and very, very publicly. Every year from their inception in 1870 until at least 1933, the Post and the Women's Auxiliary that they had would travel throughout the Boston area um, to places like Ransford Island uh, Cemetery in the Harbor, Woodlawn Cemetery in Everett, and Mount Hope Cemetery in Mattapan and they would leave uh, wreaths at the grave sites of their fallen comrades. Um, they would also always make sure to go to Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge to leave a wreath for Robert Gouldshaw. Their loyalty was also shown in 1897, just before the dedication of the 54th Memorial. A week before the ceremony um, was going to occur, Burl Smith, a uh, former member of the 54th, was interviewed by the Boston Daily Advertiser. Now Smith always claimed that he was the first man to enlist in 1863. Um, he was actually one of the first four men to enlist, um, but he was the one who was able to live the longest. Um, and he had also acted as commander for the Bell Post. His family had a long history of agitating for equal rights. His father, Burl Smith Sr., hosted Harriet Tubman in their home, which uh, was located on Cambridge Street, today uh, approximately where the Whole Foods Market is on that road. They also hosted a number of freedom seekers. Um, and as one of the most prominent Black men of Boston in that time period, Smith knew that his words carried weight. His interview ran on the first page of the Boston Daily Advertiser, and at the end of it, uh, Smith made a plea stating, quote, Memorial Day will be the happiest day of my life. I have prayed the good Lord to spare my life until that time, and I think he is going to do it. The only drawback is that all the members of the regiment will not be able to be here. Some are at a distance and others are blind and lame. And as no carriages have been provided for them, they cannot appear in the procession. I don't like to complain, but I should think some means might be provided for the accommodation of those who cannot walk. Perhaps if you speak of it in the paper, it may be brought to the people's attention and public opinion may influence the committee to act. Those are very specifically chosen words by uh, Burl Smith. And by using those specific words and the political capital that he and his family had built up over the previous 60 years, Smith was continuing the long and proud tradition, not only of that abolitionist family, but also of the GAR. Now, they had a number of members in this post, um, and one of the most um, noticeable ones around the streets of Boston was this gentleman. Um, his name is Eli George Bedell. 
Sometimes though, he is called George Eli Bedell, um, kind of flip flops every once in a while. Um, he was a, uh, born in Pennsylvania, but as a teenager, he and his mother moved to Boston. And on February 14th of 1863, Bedell left school and started walking along the streets of Boston. And he was kind of in a really mad uh, mindset. Um, according to one biographer, Bedell had just been kicked out of class for refusing to join his fellow classmates in the daily singing of My Country Tis of Thee. Because as he told that biographer later, he could not see how the United States could be a sweet land of liberty to an African-American experiencing racism. While out on the streets that day, uh, his feet brought him to the recruitment station for the 54th and he signed his name onto the roster. Now, as I said, he was only 17 years old at the time and he was assigned to company A of the 54th. During the assault on Wagner, he, was, he sustained two very serious wounds, uh, one in the neck and one in the shoulder. And while they were severe, he was able to heal enough to stay with the regiment and continue to fight until he was honorably discharged in 1865. Now, after he was discharged and returned to civilian life, uh, he became a minister in the AME Zion Church, and he would serve as a pastor at various churches throughout Massachusetts and Connecticut, including the AME Zion Church on Columbus Avenue here in Boston. Now, like many other veterans of the 54th in positions of power, Bedell used his fame to fight against racism and help protect the destitute members of his regiment. Bedell's message was clear and constant. Only by dealing with all of its citizens justly would the United States be able to move forward together. He would preach this from the pulpits throughout New England. Um, and as one of the loudest and proudest members of the 54th in the nation, uh, Bedell was given a lot of great honor. Um, he was actually selected in 1938 by President Roosevelt to participate in the blue and gray reunion at the battlefield of Gettysburg. Now in this image, uh, Bedell is the gentleman in the center here. There would be 10 men, uh, 10 Union veteran soldiers um, who would stand on one side of the fence and there would be 10 Confederate veterans standing on the other side of the fence and they would be um, staring right at a person they might have been fighting 75 years earlier, but they would be shaking hands instead. At the event in 1938, Bedell waited a moment for the former Confederate across the fence to extend his hand. And as that man did, he supposedly told Bedell, quote, many years ago, you were shooting at me and I was shooting at you. Thank God we both missed. As time went on, Bedell became one of the final representatives for the 54th, but um, whenever called upon, he would appear in public to remind people of the sacrifice that he and his comrades made in the 1860s. And at many of these events, he would be accompanied by his grandson named George. Now, George fondly recalled mar marching in many parades with his grandfather in his Navy sailor suit. Um, and years after his grandfather passed away, um, George enlisted in the military himself. And he recalled his grandfather passing on some words of wisdom to do the harder right than the easier wrong. On April 8th, 1940, Bedell passed away at the ripe age of 97 years old. And in his obituary, he was touted as the last remaining member of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. I have not found any other veteran who lived longer than him. He would be buried with full military honors uh, with delegates from the Sons of the Union Veterans, the American Legion, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars at Mount Hope Cemetery in Mattapan, Massachusetts. Now, not everybody, uh, when they finished the war, uh, decided to move to Boston or live there. Um, we have a lot of people who would go back to New Bedford, but a large contingent moved to Worcester. And that includes this uh, young man here. Um, this was Alexander Howard Johnson. 
So he was not a member of the Robert A. Bell Post in Boston, but he would often visit um, and he would always bring his most trusted weapon, his drum. Born Alexander Howard around 1847 in New Bedford, um, his background is a big question mark. Um, some reports say that his father was a black man and mother belonged to the Narragansett tribe. Others claim that both of his parents belonged to different tribes. Um, but what we do know is that by the age of five, unfortunately, Alexander Howard was an orphan. Luckily, uh, he would be adopted very quickly by a man named William Henry Johnson, uh, who gave him not only a home, but his last name. Uh, William Henry Johnson was one of the first black lawyers in Massachusetts. Um, and Alexander Johnson quickly showed a affinity for drumming at an early age. One story that we've found associated with him is that on the day of the execution of John Brown in 1859, Alexander Johnson heard another man out on the streets rolling his drum in honor of Brown. Johnson said that he was inspired, ran into his home, grabbed his tiny drum, marched out into the street, and began to play his own role in honor of Brown. And that's as a 12-year-old um, boy. So it might not be surprising that just four years later, at the age of 16, uh, Johnson would enlist in the 54th. And he was assigned to Company C as their drummer. He liked to claim that after he enlisted, Robert Gouldshaw referred to him as the original drummer boy, as he was one of the first musicians to join up. And he stated later in life that during the run up to the battle of, at Fort Wagner, um, that he and Robert Gouldshaw were marching together at the head of the columns of men. Uh, he was sent to the rear during that battle um, and he might have acted as a stretcher bearer um, as many other musicians did during battle. Now, I don't know um, if a lot of his stories are true. Um, sometimes you start off with a normal story and then as you get older, it grows and grows and grows. Um, in later interviews, Johnson stated that he was wounded once in the leg and that his drum received six shots of its own. Um, but looking at his files that I have access to, um, those records do not support that. They only mention that he lost a complete musician's sword set while serving and had no um, injuries to himself. But that doesn't matter because Alexander Johnson was able to survive the two and a half years of war and go back to Massachusetts where he would move to Worcester um, and carrying with him, um, he would have his drum. Now he returned to, he went to uh, move to Worcester um, and started to uh, do a lot of the normal things you do when you are a 18, 19 year old man. He uh, started to uh, date his wife, they got married um, and he and his wife Mary would have 17 children, though only 10 would survive childbirth. He definitely needed to figure out a way to support this large family. And so Johnson turned to the one thing that was really constant in his life, which was his drum. Now you can see him in this amazing image here, right? Third from the left, um, holding a drum and uh, he has a cigar in his mouth. I don't have any idea what this event was, but it is not a spontaneous event. It looks very planned. Um, and Johnson would end up becoming a drum teacher. He also ended up organizing a uh, drum corps, uh, which he named the Johnson Drum Corps. And thanks to these two things, Johnson stated in an interview that, quote, there is hardly a drummer who marches the streets of Worcester who has not received instruction from him. And though he did not hold a, uh, the rank, this rank during the war, um, he started to get a nickname from the people of Worcester. They started to refer to him as the major whenever they saw him, and he fully embraced this nickname. Um, it was used in articles about him throughout his life and used in, in his obituary as well. And partially that might be because the Johnson Drum Corps was everywhere. Um, they would perform at parades, they would perform at funerals, 
They would be at political rallies, reunions, carnivals, and holiday parties, and more. And when they weren't outside or at another institution, they would be, could be found at their home base at the General George H. Ward Post, uh, which was established in 1867. Uh, while Johnson uh, would be present at many political events in Worcester because they would be held at that GAR post, he also would travel to Boston to support causes that were very close to his heart. On July 18th, one of those events happened. Now, July 18th is the anniversary of the assault at Fort Wagner and the 54th and the Robert A. Bell Post and other organizations would usually have a um, event commemorating that. And this year in 1917, the people of Boston were invited to join the um, commemorations at Faneuil Hall, but also to come and do what a lot of these men uh, started in 1863, which was to agitate together. This, as I said, was called to celebrate the 54th anniversary of the Battle of Fort Wagner. Maybe it, um, because of that year, it kind of had a very special tone to it, but the time period and what was going on in America at that same time also added another layer to this event. So while they were celebrating the, uh, the 54th, they also were using this event to celebrate the continued uh, patriotism of Boston's black community, to shed light on inequalities, and also to speak out against atrocities that were being um, carried out throughout the nation. Only five members of the 54th were able to attend. Many had unfortunately passed away. Um, the men who were able to attend were all from Massachusetts. They were from Lynn, New Bedford, Melrose, uh, Boston and Worcester. And they knew that they had to come in for this event because of its importance. Um, as America started to contemplate entering into the Great War, now known as World War I, uh, Black men were once again being relegated to the sides and not being allowed to fight fully for their country. Not only that, but there had been a huge uptick in uh, lynchings and racial violence throughout the United States that worried uh, Bostonians enough that they wanted to make it publicly known that they stood absolutely completely against all these events. Um, and they had a series of resolutions that they uh, voted on during this event. Um, two events that they uh, focused on were the recent lynching of L. Persons in Memphis, Tennessee. He was a 50-year-old black man accused of raping and murdering a 15-year-old white girl. Um, the lynching of persons was described as one of the worst ever in American history. Uh, and then one that was even closer in memory as it had literally just ended, um, the massacres in East St. Louis. Those went from May to July of that year, just weeks before. And there were between 40 and 250 African-Americans who were killed in that massacre and another 6,000 were left homeless. The five members of the 54th, they had been through so much personally and also in the military. They were elders, but they decided that they needed to stand up once again and fight for the equality, respect, and safety of Black Americans, just like they had 54 years before. Now, once the event at Faneuil Hall was done, um, they moved outside because no event commemorating and celebrating the 54th in Boston would be complete without a visit to the memorial that was dedicated to them on Boston Common. In 1904, Johnson was quoted as saying um, on a visit to the memorial that the drummer in the statue was modeled after him and that he thought that the sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens had captured his likeliness at a very high level. He thought it made him look excellent. Um, we don't know if that's true. Um, there is some new research being done on who St. Gaudens was using as his models. He might have talked with some of the veterans, but we aren't sure. Um, what we do know is true, though, from the reports and articles written about this event, is that at the memorial that day, Alexander Howard Johnson once again raised his drumsticks and began to play his drum. Fighting racial injustice comes in many different forms. 
Sometimes it requires you to catch people's attention with a loud noise, like drumming or hitting a drum. Um, other times you need to fight from within the system and use the power that you have and to speak up for those who have no power. And for others, it's simply being around, telling your story and hoping that it will inspire the next generation to continue the fight that started in 1863. I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, we're going to take some questions, uh, but before we do that, I just want to encourage you to uh, come out to some of our next programs. And I'd like to especially highlight um, tomorrow's program that we are holding in conjunction with Boston Harbor now. It's called Revolutionary Harbor, the Transatlantic World of Peter Faneuil. And we'll talk about the uh, research that we've been doing as a team on Peter Faneuil, um, his role in slave trade in Boston and Boston's role in the transatlantic slave world as well. Um, so thank you again. And uh, with that, I think we will uh, move on to questions. All right. Um, so apologies, earlier. Um, so I have a couple of questions here for you, John. Okay, so first, uh, do you hear an echo? I do hear an echo on your side. Um, while we think about that, I will answer um, a question that I just saw pop up. Um, from Gwen. I am not related to Robert Gould Shaw. Um, it is just a coincidence that we share um, a name. He uh, was married before he uh, fought during the uh, Civil War um, and unfortunately passed away before he could have any children, um, though he does have um, some descendants through uh, his other family members. All right, cool. So um, I got two. So there are a couple questions that were kind of similar. So I think I'll, I'll group some of them in. Um, so first, a uh, couple questions about uh, like surviving the war. Someone wanted to know uh, roughly how many people died at the Battle of Fort Wagner and then how many men survived the war from the 54th. Um, so they um didn't have all the men in the regiment go and fight at Fort Wagner. Um, they had about 600 men who went into battle and about 200 of them were um, wounded, killed, or lost. Um, there's a lot of question about, um, in the files especially, about um, missing since the assault on Fort Wagner, presumed dead or presumed a prisoner. And it's going to take you know, two and a half years to try and figure out some of those answers. Um, the 54th has a pretty good um, track record. I don't have an exact number of how many survived since the number is constantly rolling back and forth, um, but they do a better job of staying together as a group. Um, the 55th is going to experience a lot of um, loss through death and missing. Uh, especially at Honey Hill. Great. Uh, so next question. Um, how was it decided which men were transferred to the 55th? Basically, how was the 55th Massachusetts formed? Um, so sometimes uh, it is done because these men have a skill. Um, that is useful. So one reason why Charles Douglas was transferred is because he had extremely nice handwriting and um, they transferred him because they needed a clerk in the fifth. Um, other men had skills like uh, blacksmithing or um, maybe they were school teachers or, or something that could be useful. Um, in one account that I read, uh, James Monroe Trotter shows up to join the 54th and he gets there when they are basically all full. So they decide, nope, you're going to be in the 55th today. Um, and that seems to be a uh, thing that is very common in the military. 
Um, you don't ask why, you just say yes. Um, and if they wanna move you, they will move you. Um, so that also happens during the war, they'll um, kind of juggle people around to make sure that the ranks are, are full enough. Great, thanks. Uh, so I think we have probably time for about one or two more questions. Um, so wanted to ask, um, how difficult was it to gather all of your historical records? And then kind of as a second part to that, um, has studying and presenting this information changed the way you think about history or history education? So kind of, I think process and then what that process has kind of, you know, helped you uncover when you're talking about this sort of history. Um, those are, that's a great question. Um, so I worked previously at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, which is now also called American Ancestors. Um, and it's through my work with them that I really have gained a lot of experience um, trying to figure out where these men um, left traces, because it's not really records. For a lot of them, it's, it's shadows, it's traces of themselves. Um, and being able to just kind of relax your mind and think about, well, this is how I would spell this person's name. But maybe if I look at it this way, um, you know, the, I saw that with uh, George Eli or Eli George Fidel, switching the, the first names around really helped um, try and find the, uh, the various records. And I just literally found um, that picture of him from Gettysburg on Saturday. Um, so this is a continuing process. Um, and I think that um, researching these men um, has really kind of opened my eyes to um, ways that we need to get, um, especially school kids, interested in history um, and learning about people who might look like them, who might come from similar backgrounds for them. Um, right now I'm researching the 55th Massachusetts who uh, they are right there with the 54th. They're like a step behind, but the 54th gets all the literal glory. Um, and the 55th is just kind of there picking up along the way, kind of like somebody's little brother. Um, and looking at these records and looking at the stories of these men, um, you know, it's, it's America's story. Um, Black history is American history. And I think one of the things that people need to start thinking about is American history more holistically um, and you know, finding that thing that interests you. Because I'm not a Civil War researcher. I don't um, enjoy uh, the minutia of battle, um, but I love stories of the men and their families because they, they add such depth to our knowledge and really make it easy for us to connect with them, even though, it's 2021, so yeah. All right, so I think with that, um, we're kind of coming up close here on time. Um, I realized that there were some questions that we were unable to get to. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat that allows you to contact us. Uh, so please, you know, feel free to reach out with any additional questions. You know, that's what we're here for and, you know, always excited to share. Um, great job, Jocelyn. And uh, with that, I can uh, turn it over to Karen to close us out. As I don't unmute myself and pop back in for you guys. Okay. This is absolutely amazing. I love, love this series so much, um, especially what we were talking about towards the end is I learned, <clears throat> I like to say I learned a quarter of history in school and now I'm learning a whole bunch more, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you so, so, so much for doing, for doing this. Um, as you can see, I listened, did not talk during your presentation, so I had to clear the throat out. I probably should have done that before, uh, but I really, we all really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for coming out on this day. Um, it was absolutely amazing. If you didn't catch the, uh, the, any of the information in the chat or you have a question later and you don't remember, you didn't write down the information, you can always email the BPL. We are ask at bpl.org. That is ask, A-S-K, at bpl.org. And we can always send it along. 
Uh, you won't have your answer the next day, but you will eventually get your answer. Um, and we would love for you to join us on our next conversation, uh, or lecture actually, um, on the 2nd of March, and it is the Women's Error Club, a story of Black women's activism, and that is going to be amazing, because it is also the kickoff of Women's History Month. Yes, it's very exciting. Um, so thank you everyone for coming, and we hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone.